<clears throat> the Old Testament lesson today is taken from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 through 24. It's found in your pew Bible, page 253. Elijah had taken refuge with a widow and her son during the great drought. When the son died, Elijah prayed and restored him back to life. Page 253 in your pew Bible. Sometime later, the son of the woman who had owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. The New Testament lesson is taken from the first book, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 22, page 815 in your Bible. There would be no hope for us without Christ's resurrection, but Christ was raised from the dead. Jesus is alive. Page 815, verses 12 through 22. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Please rise for the hearing of the gospel. It's taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10, found in the Pew Bible, page 706. The resurrection of Jesus, according to Matthew's gospel. 20, Matthew 28, 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the, woman, the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. You may be seated. As the women went to the tomb, they didn't find what they expected. They didn't find a person there that they were looking for. They were looking for Jesus, but they did find an angel 
or according to which gospel you read, two angels, but one angel spoke to them. I'd like to point out several things from the angel's message to the women. In verse 5, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. And there's a kind of a fourfold message in the angel's message to the women, and I'd like to talk about those four things. First of all, fear not. Don't be afraid. Just about every time an angel appears in the Bible, that's the first words that come out of the angel's mouth. Oftentimes because the people are about ready to faint away. But there is something fearsome and awe-inspiring about angels. It just has to be. It's that way because that's, you know, people are always afraid. They're, the angel brings those words for a reason. There's something that just makes us terrified at the sight. Perhaps that it's because they are of the spirit world and we just somehow sense that when we see them. You know, the spirits is kind of a modern word for ghosts. So if you think about, you know, the gold cartoon Casper the Friendly Ghost, whenever people see a ghost, they go, ah, and they, you know, jump out of their skin or whatever. Well, that's kind of the way it is. It's spirits. Uh, that's what an angel is, is a spirit. Although they can and often do take on physical characteristics. Perhaps it's because they're from God. We know that. We sense that God is doing something there in the person of that angel, and that makes us afraid. Perhaps simply it's because they're unknown or different, and we fear oftentimes the unknown and the unfamiliar. But if we think, or maybe if we prepare ourselves a little bit beforehand, I mean, who knows? Maybe an angel will appear to us someday. But if we think just a little about it, what are angels? Who are angels? The Bible tells us they are ministering spirits sent from God to serve those who will inherit salvation. That's who they are. That's what they do. God sends them to us for a purpose and for a good purpose. And if we think about it that way, we can think that, you know, to me, angels are a lot like lightning. You know, if you see the lightning, you're safe. You know, if you haven't seen it, you probably got big problems and you'll end up in the hospital or the morgue. And the same way that an angel, if you can see an angel, you're probably safe. You better open your ears. But if, you know, the angel had meant to do you harm, you would already have known it. The angels in the Bible only are sent to destroy those who are actively opposing God. And we only have to think about Pharaoh and his armies or the Assyrian army that was trying to annihilate Judah. And God sent an angel and they didn't know what hit them. But for you, do you believe in John 3.16? God loved the world so much he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, if you believe in him, you will not perish but have eternal life. Do you trust in Jesus? If you do, then fear not because the angel has come to bring you a message from God, a message that God wants you to know and to act on, something to help you to encourage you, to lift you up in your soul as, as you go towards God throughout your life. Someone has said the Bible has 366 places that say fear not. Well, that's one for every day of the year, including leap year. So, you know, that kind of tells us something. Maybe we should fear not more often. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 10, as he was sending the disciples out, which, by the way, he does with us all the time, doesn't he? That's the Great Commission. He sends us out into the world. But Jesus told the disciples, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but afterwards can do nothing to the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Yes, the only fear, the only fear that the Bible wants us to have is fear of God which the Bible describes as the beginning of wisdom. That's kind of our starting place. But in all other things, the Bible is clear. Fear not. So the angel said to the women, fear not. Secondly, the angel said, he is not here. He is risen. 
In Luke's gospel, the angels say, why do you seek for the living among the dead? The tomb wasn't a very good place to look for Jesus. That's not where he dwelt. That's not where he was spending any time. No tomb could ever contain the Lord of life. Besides, Jesus himself had told them numerous times, again and again, the third day I will rise from the dead. And so whether or not they should have, they didn't believe it. It just didn't enter their mind. And we shouldn't really be hard on the disciples. If we were there, we probably wouldn't have believed it either. I mean, let's be honest about it. But we're so used to hearing the message. We were brought up every Easter celebrating Christ's resurrection. We can't conceive of a world where that was the unexpected. But truly, this was something new that they had no way of suspecting. Jesus had raised others, but for he himself to raise from the dead, this just didn't enter their minds. But that was then, and this is now. We know that Jesus did rise from the dead, as the angel said. Don't look for him in the tomb, the angel told the women. He'll find him somewhere else. There are places that are better to look for Jesus than others, aren't there? We know he has promised that we will find him in his word. We will find him in the holy sacraments of the church, his body and blood and communion and in the washing of baptism. We know that we'll find Jesus within our hearts as we pray especially because he has promised to be with us always. We know that we can find Jesus in the person of our neighbor, especially those in need. We know that we can find Jesus in the face of the poor. We know that we can find Jesus in church. He promised to be here wherever two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus told us. There am I in their midst. But there are also places where we're not likely to find him. We're not likely to find the Lord Jesus in an arrogant heart. We're not likely to find him in hands and feet that rush off to do evil. We're not likely to find him in a deceitful tongue. And even buildings of wood and stone, even church buildings, aren't guaranteed that we'll find Jesus there. Ezekiel shows us in chapter 8 through 11, Ezekiel has this terrifying vision how the priests and, and the leaders of the people are worship, worshiping idols and doing all sorts of things they ought not to be doing. And the Spirit of the Lord comes out of the temple, goes to the Mount of Olives, and just leaves Jerusalem altogether. He wasn't there in the temple any longer. And some of the priests, as a result, as their punishment, fell over dead. If God would leave his own temple that Solomon built for his glory, we should not rest secure in one building made of wood or stone. But rather, we are his house. And that's why he promised to be with us when we come together, whatever the building is. But as the angel told the women. He's not here in the tomb. He is risen. He is alive. Thirdly, the angel invited the women to see. Come in and see the place where he lay, the angel said. Come in and see for yourself, just as the psalmist years before said, taste and see the Lord is good. Come experience for yourselves. And when Peter and John heard the news, that's exactly what they did too. They ran to the tomb to see for themselves. And apparently, according to Matthew's gospel, at least some of the soldiers saw for themselves. Now that was against their will. They could have cared less what was going on there. They were just put there because the high priest uh, wanted them there and Pilate ordered them to go there. But some of them experienced Christ's resurrection too. But, you know, the angel didn't roll the stone away so that Jesus could get out. Jesus, I'm sure, if he, you know, if he could raise from the dead, he'd have no problem getting out of the tomb. You know, it just doesn't make good sense that he'd have a problem with that. But the angel rolled the stone away 
so that witnesses could come in, so that people could go in and see that Jesus was not there. The angel rolled the stone away for our benefit. As the Old Testament lesson was being read this morning, you know, Elijah raised that boy from the dead. And his successor, Elisha, raised the person from the dead. In fact, he did another person after he died. A person came in touch with Elisha's bones and was resurrected. Jesus himself resurrected people, Peter and Paul. You think the Lord is trying to tell us something. There is a resurrection. Joseph, when he went to tell the dreams of Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 41, Pharaoh had two dreams that were much the same. They were identical in meaning. And this is what Joseph said, and this is a good biblical principle. The Lord has shown you the same thing twice, and by showing it to you twice, it means that he's certain to do it. And if the Lord resurrected half a dozen and more people throughout scriptures, I think that's a pretty sure sign he wants us to depend on that. Resurrection is coming, and it's here in the person of Jesus Christ. But just as the angels told the women that first Easter morning, come and see for yourselves, so we too are invited to check for ourselves, check the evidence. Jesus told Thomas, blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. And yet, all the disciples doubted until they saw. And not many of us will see personally, but that doesn't mean there isn't good evidence for the resurrection. There's a lot of authors outside of the Bible that wrote about Christ and the fact of his crucifixion and resurrection. And any honest examination of all the evidence then available to us must conclude that the tomb is empty and that Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead. As we read through the rest of Matthew 28, the Jewish leaders then, they decided they needed to make up a story to explain the fact that he was risen, an alternate story, if you will. But the existence of these false stories, these other theories, only serves to prove the fact. That's what happens when people oppose Christ. They have to try to come up with some explanation. But the fact is there. Christ is risen. And so, as the angel said, the Bible tells us also, come and see, come and experience for yourselves. And then fourthly, the angel said, go quickly and tell his disciples. The women were told to spread the good news, to share their joy. And that in, in itself is a principle. You know, for some reason, we kind of separate Bible with, from the rest of life, and we treat it differently. But if you think back when your favorite team won the championship, or when you got engaged, or when your children were born, or when you got something you really wanted for Christmas, some of those big events happened. What was your immediate reaction? Well, you had to blabber the news out to everybody, didn't you? You had to tell the world what was going on and how great the Lord has blessed you and, and so on and so forth. Joy is something meant to be shared. And we do that. But Jesus rising from the dead is the best, most joyous news of all. As 1 Corinthians 15 points out, if it means anything at all, if it's true, we have everything to be joyful about. If it's not true, of course, we are most to be pitied. We're hopeless. We're all in vain. If it's not true, the Bible is a lot, is fairy tales and Jesus is a liar, but we know it is true that Jesus is alive. Our sins are forgiven. God does love us. God loves each and every one of you more than you can ever realize. We do have the sure and certain hope of eternal life in Christ, and we have blessings in this life as well. Through Jesus' resurrection, then, the, the good news we have to share is much better than any more, uh, any mega million lottery or anything that we can experience in this life. We have won the kingdom of heaven, 
a gift of Christ to us. So our natural reaction is to want to share and spread the joy that Christ died for our sins and that he rose from the dead according to the scriptures. Someone said once, the idea is not to keep the faith, but to share it. The idea is to give it away. Ziggy in one cartoon, one of my favorite cartoons a long time ago, said love is the only thing you get more of when you give it away. Well, it's not the only thing, faith also. But that's the idea. We want to give it away. It not only helps others, it helps ourselves as well. Give away the good news of salvation. Go and tell. So the angel's fourfold message, fear not. He's not here in the tomb. He's alive. Come and see. And then go and tell the good news. May we hear and receive and fulfill the angel's fourfold message in our lives. Amen.